of June 4th, 2015, the United States was $18.153 trillion in debt. Now that doesn't just happen overnight, people. So how exactly did America get up to its neck in debt? Every year, a budget is formed, doling out large sums of federal money to three main areas. The first of these is discretionary spending, which in 2015 received $1.1 trillion. The second section is mandatory spending, which received $2.45 trillion in the year 2015. Lastly, there's the interest on the federal debt, which received $229 billion. This all totaled at a whopping $3.8 trillion. Now, in order to pay for these things, the government has to take in money somehow. And this is how a budget works. You have your revenue and your expense. In other words, money you take in and money you put out. In the case of the U.S. government, revenue is created through taxation. When the amount of money taken in through taxes doesn't equal the money put out through spending, we have what's called a deficit. In order to make up for this deficit, the government sells treasury bonds. This is essentially a loan from a third party. This sounds like a pretty sweet deal until you realize that we actually have to pay these people back at some point. Borrowing can be a temporary solution to an unbalanced budget, but it's really the cause of an even greater problem. The national debt is a sum total of all past deficits, and it represents all the money that future generations, <coughs> my generation, <coughs> are going to have to pay back. Dear candidates, I would like to know how you, if elected president, will deal with the debt crisis that our nation is facing today. Sincerely, Olivia. Growth. This very serious debt crisis has got to be solved through shared sacrifice. We have tremendous cutting to do. The train wreck that is our federal balance sheet, the only way it gets fixed is if there's growth. The wealthiest people in this country and the largest corporations in this country have also got to play a role in deficit reduction. Hundreds of billions of dollars is going to be saved just in terms of running government. As you can see, there's no shortage of ideas for potential solutions. But if ideas are a dime a dozen, then why do we still have this problem? Nancy Pelosi claims there's no more cuts to make and the cupboard is bare. But I don't think the cupboard is quite bare. In fact, I see infinite amounts of waste in discretionary spending alone. Take the arts, for example. The National Endowment for the Arts receives over $100 million of federal funding per year. Their budget request for 2016 totaled at $149.949 million. And that's $149 million we don't have to spare. Now, I'm an art kid in every sense of the word. Music and film are pretty much my life, and I own just about every color of beret imaginable. But I do think this is one area where we can safely cut down on federal spending. So, right now the Arts Alliance Tulsa doesn't receive money from the government, but would you say that you're still making a difference in, in the community without government money? Definitely, and you know, the arts organizations that we represent have been doing so for decades. They've been making it on their own without the government funding. In Tulsa today, we've just solely relied on the generosity of our foundations and individuals to really keep this going. My community is living proof that the government is not an essential component in keeping the arts alive. So if you still think there's no room to cut, then you need to think again. Oh, hello there. The budget plan that President Barack Obama proposed for 2016 included spending appropriations totaling $4.1 trillion. Now, tax revenues would only equal $3.5 trillion. No, that can't be right. No. time trying to wrap my head around why the president would propose a budget plan that sets us at a 474 billion dollar deficit. I mean, our budget is over budget. Now, apparently nobody else sees the flaw in that logic because over the last 50 years, we've ran a deficit for all but 5. And 
since the idea of a debt ceiling was first created in 1917, it's been raised nearly 150 times. So, what exactly is the point of having a budget and a debt ceiling if we're just going to keep going over budget and raising the debt ceiling? Now, I may be misinterpreting the facts here, but I'm pretty sure that's called being irresponsible. As I gained knowledge and understanding about the debt crisis through working on this project, I decided for myself that the only solution was to make drastic spending cuts across the board. In fact, I was so sure about my solution that I decided to approach presidential candidate Senator Rubio and ask him about it directly. What you, if elected, will be willing to sacrifice in order to regain control of government spending? Well, it's not about sacrifice uh, as much as it is about making changes to Medicare and Social Security for future generations, because that's what's driving the debt. We can leave it exactly the way it is for people that are retired now or about to retire. But for younger Americans like myself and like you and the people watching this, it, the program's going to work differently. It'll still be the best thing in the world, but it'll work differently. Well, instead of retiring at 67, I'm going to have to retire at 68, for example. But that'll help bring the debt under control. After talking with Senator Rubio about it, I realized it's not that simple. And when I heard him say it's not so much about sacrifice, it was the first time I ever stopped to consider, maybe I don't have all the answers. Well, I thought we were up to our next. We're really in way over our heads. This is why I most want the federal debt to be discussed in the presidential campaign. Because I don't know how to fix it, but America needs a leader who does. So candidates, the ball is in your court. 